Chapter 30 Hunters and Prey What are you on the lookout for? Two very angry types of movements. Slow, lumbering, powerful movements, and jerky, erratic, excitable movements. Both coming for the kill. Virtues My first real advice out of the stable was to find my virtue. Well, no. It was to find a weapon, armor, and friends. And as daunting a task as that seemed, I believed I had succeeded admirably. It was the advice that followed, to find the defining positive characteristic that would help me get through the darkest horrors the equestrian wasteland could throw at me without losing myself, that still eluded me. Instead, I had substituted other goals, other quests. I was driven to make this blasted world a better place, a brighter place for the ponies trapped within it. I felt all my efforts had just hit a wall. Red Eye was just too smart, too devious, and too well organized. I underestimated him at every turn and he used it against me with skill approaching panache. Even his seemingly insane claim to approaching God who was backed by a crafty and altogether horrifying plan, the sheer cruelty, the coldly calculated butchering of unicorns in an act that would surpass murder, struck a blow to my very soul. And yet, I could already envision his argument. What is the suffering death of a few dozen, or possibly even hundred unicorns today, for generations of safety and peace for millions in the future? I tasted bile. The goddess was... insane. And yet she was effectively untouchable, immensely powerful, and her army of minions, while considerably smaller in number than Red Eyes, were amongst the most formidable opponents in the entire wasteland, and they were completely devoted, if not directly controlled, by her whims. And her whims amounted to our extinction. And she was such a potent telepath that even if I could come up with a plan, she would rip it from my mind before I even get close enough to implement it. We were racing apotheosis, and we were losing. I felt the darkness closing in oppressively. If ever I needed a virtue to hold on to, it was now. But even virtues can turn on you. They could go astray, become warped or perverted. Wadger had told me of the six greatest virtues of pony kind. Kindness, laughter, generosity, honesty, loyalty, and magic. Although he made it clear that there were many others, and that my own was likely not on that sacred list. I had quipped that I could possibly collect broken, wrecked versions of each of these. I was doing far better at that, it seemed, than finding ponies of true virtue. Still, I had been joking. Now I had met the goddess, the thing that was Trixie, and I knew I had witnessed the epitome of the corrupted virtue of magic. All I needed to do was find corrupted kindness, and I'd have a set. Oh, but you have met corrupted kindness, little Pip. The cruel, sweet voice of the goddess blasted through my head, swarmed with a chorus of whispers, mostly agreeing. The weight of her thoughts on my mind was heavy, almost suffocating. It's you. No. No, that was not right. She couldn't be right. I was better than that. I had to be better than that. But even as I fiercely denied the goddess's sadistic suggestion, my mind conjured up doubts and demons as if seeking to prove her right. I had saved the slaves from old Appaloosa, only to abandon them to the care of a town that traded with slavers. I had slaughtered the raiders who raped and hunted that blue pony in Manhattan, only to walk away and leave her to her fate once the immediate threat had passed. How many more? How many other times had I inserted myself into a situation, tried to help, and then left? Should I count all of Philadelphia as a victim of my kindness? I remembered my image in that mirror, reflecting my soul. Was twisted kindness what I had seen there? Was it a monster? No. No, this was sick and poisoned thinking. It was the goddess mercilessly tormenting me where I was weak. I had a virtue. A good and true one, just waiting for me to discover it. I had to. We stepped out of Maripone's most intact structure and into the angry daylight, four of the goddess's alicorns guiding us back to where the Sky Bandit had landed. My pit buck began to click at me. The balefire bomb had been detonated underground here. The radiation bleeding off of the splendid valley sinkhole was nowhere near as close to the horror of the Philadelphia crater. At least, not above the ground. A nearby wall held what appeared to be a map of the building above a pair of ruined water fountains. My pit buck's click clicking sped up ominously as I brought it close to them, but I was more interested in the scanning of the map for future reference. I suspected I might need it. 
All around us, alicorns watched silently from behind crumbled walls or stood amongst broken pillars and collapsed rubble. Their silent presence was eerie and sinister. Thriving? Velvet Remedy asked in a hushed voice, dipping her head. It feels more like they haunt this place. I nodded, lowering my voice to reply almost instinctually, as if the alicorn's silence demanded we speak softly. And you notice how they haven't said anything? Not one of them had telepathically spoken a word since we encountered them in Splendid Valley. In previous encounters, they had been boastfully chatty. I think the proximity of the goddess is overwhelming them. Their individual minds are being drowned out by hers. This close, they become little more than drones. Not that I care much for their individual personalities, Calamity chimed in, whispering. Seeing as they were all variations of the goddess's great rah-rah-us-yala insects, silence ain't entirely ungolden. After a moment of thought, he continued. I reckon it's the taint. Splendid Valley's ripe with it, he pointed out. She seems to be able to communicate with her so-called children outside, but nothing like this, and not with normal folk except in very special cases like Red Eye. But here, she's in our heads like it weren't nothing. I'm betting this whole valley's a massive amplifier to her. Wonderful. Well, then don't any pony think anything about what we're going to do now until we're out of this goddess's forsaken place. Calamity barked a laugh at my choice of phrasing. The alicorns, of course, said nothing. They wove us through the rubble to the flat of asphalt which had once been a landing zone for sky chariots. The sky bandit sat waiting for us. On the roof, Pyrolite danced and hooted our return. Velvet Remedy stopped. Calamity hesitated, his ears picking up as he watched the bird. Hold it here, he whispered, putting a foreleg out to block me. The four alicorns kept walking towards the sky bandit, either unaware or unconcerned that their charges had stopped following. That sounds like a warning. Another alicorn dropped out of the sky behind us and raised her shield. It is. Velvet Remedy breathed. The four alicorns trotted up to the sky bandit, the lead one beginning to turn towards us expectantly when the asphalt around them erupted in blasts of magical energy. All four alicorns were killed, three instantly with two of them melting into goo, the fourth collapsing several yards away, missing multiple limbs and bleeding to death with a pitiful whinny. Velvet Remedy's horn flared up as her anesthetic spell allowed the creature to spend her last seconds without pain. The alicorns in the ruins around us stumbled in unison. Two more fell as shafts of colored light sliced through the air. Velvet Remedy muttered something, closing her eyes as her horn flared and five small flickering orbs of energy shot from the tip. One of the orbs drifted swiftly over my head and floated there. One stayed above Velvet. The other sought out Calamity, Zenith, and Pyrelet and hovered over them like tiny guardians. New spell? Velvet Remedy nodded, saying, I'll explain later, as she looked for a way to run. The alicorns in the ruins were bringing up their shields. The air was filling with magical energy blasts. A pack of hellhounds was charging across the tops of the rubble, moving with terrifying speed to engage the alicorns under the covering fire of more hellhounds in the valley. They'd mined the landing pad. My mind conjured up images of hellhounds digging up from beneath us until less than half an inch of asphalt separated their holes from the world above, then wonder gluing the mines to that thin barrier and filling the holes behind them. Back inside, I shouted. Regroup first. Get out of the line of fire. I turned, only to find we were blocked by the shielded alicorn standing behind us. Beyond her, the doorway back into Maripony stood dark and empty. The concrete steps leading up to it tore apart explosively as the hellhounds burst out from the ground beneath us. Massive claws ripped through the alicorn's shield and tore huge chunks of meat from her side as she turned to fight it. The alicorn almost got a spell off before the hellhound ripped his claws through her face, felling her. Insolent curs! A high-pitched whistle blasted through the air and through my head, the goddess projecting both mentally and magically through the ruins of Maripony's air raid sirens. I pressed my hose to my ears, but it didn't help. I was unable to think, unable to move under the assault. Calamity, Velvet, Remedy, and Zenith all did the same, only the zebra seeming to get any respite from the effort. The hellhound immediately fell, clutching his ears and howling in pain. The others cringed in pain, then turned, fleeing blindly back into the valley. The one in front of us did not fare as well. Three alicorns descended upon him, dropping their shields as they skewered the ambushing creature driving glowing horns through his thick hide. 
One of the three was hit by a lancing beam of light blue energy and dissolved. A hellhound sniper who was either far enough away not to be debilitated by the goddess's sonic-slash-telepathic attack, or who had protection from it. Clearly, not all of these creatures were poor shots. An orange beam of light hit Calamity, striking him in the wing. For a brief moment, his whole body glowed orange, becoming a Calamity-shaped lamp. The little orb over his head popped, and the glow receded back into his wing before evaporating, leaving a hole in his wing that I could put my hoof through. Velvet Remedy's spell had saved him from being turned to ash. My Pegasus friend collapsed in shock, his scream drowned out by the goddess's attack. The sirens stopped. The attack continued, though, but now the flurry of poorly aimed beams of magical energy were replaced by a small number of expertly aimed ones. The attacks flashed uselessly against the Alicorn's shields. In the wake of the sonic attack, the Hellhounds didn't charge the base again. Uh, I really should have won my old armor, Calamity grunted as Velvet Remedy knelt over him, her horn glowing as she tried not to cry. Hey, at least I ain't bleeding out, right? The magical energy had warped the flesh of his wing around the wound and incinerated the feathers. Hush now, she ordered. Quiet now. Save your strength and let your medical pony do her work. From her pained expression, I could tell it was bad. Another bolt of energy struck the rubble we had taken refuge behind. The alicorns had flown out to strike down the snipers, but every time they got close, the hellhounds disappeared into the ground. All they were managing to do was get drawn further from base and increasingly separated. The goddess had begun recalling several, either suspecting or experiencing a trap. Did you see how all the creatures reacted when the first four were killed? Zenith asked as she hunted through her pouch of bottles and ingredients. If the Trixie monster experiences each alicorn's death, perhaps the death of so many at once is painful or disorienting to her. I nodded, filing that examination away until we were safely outside the goddess's range. I looked to Velvet and asked, Will he be okay? And will he be able to fly again? Velvet took longer to answer than I would have preferred. I can repair the structural damage to his wing with my mending spell, but I can't heal the wound. He'll need at least one extra strength restoration potion to begin the healing properly. More if he wants to fly again any time this week. And right now, we don't even possess a healing potion. She looked at me sadly. If you'll remember, I used up all of our medical supplies patching the new lot up inside Stable 2. I felt a pang of guilt. Quite a spell you got there, Calamity praised, resolutely ignoring his doctor's orders. You saved my life. Only the slightest smile touched Velvet Remedy's frowning expression. Yes, I had hoped to barter for more medical supplies from Dr. Helpinghoof, but with Ten Pony Tower surrounded by Red Eye's forces, he wasn't willing to part with anything more than a few healing bandages. So I spent part of my time there learning a couple new spells. A disintegration ward seemed prudent. Zenith pulled out a vial and offered it to Velvet. She took it and wrapped it in a telekinetic sheath, keeping it floating nearby. She scowled as she added, Unfortunately, this wing needs more than my spells and some bandages to heal. I'm going to need to cut the warped flesh away before I can start rebuilding and mending the bones of your wing. Velvet Remedy insisted remorsefully, addressing Calamity. This is magical damage. If I don't remove all the affected flesh, your wing will never heal properly. You're going to bleed a lot when I do it, but Zenith has given me something that should reduce the blood loss. She frowned. This would be excruciating, so I'm going to have to use my anesthetic spell. You're not going to be able to move for the better part of an hour. A beam of pink light struck above the doorway into Maripony. A cinder block's worth of the wall glowed and dissolved. Zenith turned to me. You made the wagon fly before. You fly us all the way from here. I shook my head. I had been asking myself the same thing. I can, but floating myself is incredibly draining. I don't think I'd be able to get us very far. And even if I could, I can't move us very fast. All those hellhound snipers would need to do is get one good shot to blow us up. Then we are trapped here until we find medical supplies for the winged one. Dang, girl, have you just not learned our names yet? I'm Calamity. My apologies. Calamity. I am not used to thinking in names or to being... The ex-slave zebra was clearly having difficulty putting her feeling into words. On a level of familiarity when names are appropriate for me to utter. 
I could have sworn I'd heard her refer to at least one of us by name before, but now that I thought about it, I couldn't place an instance. The closest I had come was her questioning how Calamity got his name. Only the largest figures in her life had been given names. Red Eye and Stern, who ruled those who had enslaved her, or figures of legend like Doom Bunny and Nightmare Moon. She'd kept her silence for how many years? I knew how impossible it had seemed to form friendships with my peers in Stable 2, having been the awkward blank flank with the alcoholic mother. Being a zebra in Philadelphia's slave pits would have been even worse. I wondered if she ever bothered to learn the names of most of her tormentors. Is this the way she'd come to identify ponies in her mind? Do you believe there may be medical supplies inside here? Zenith asked, looking towards Maripony. I checked my Pitbox auto-mapping feature as well as the scan of the wall map. To my chagrin, Maripony's medical clinic was in the section that had collapsed into the crater. Anything that had been there would be crushed, scattered, and probably tainted. There were bathrooms that might have medical boxes, but would they be stocked with the sort of medical supplies Calamity needed? I felt it was doubtful, and I wasn't eager to try. The horror of what lurked in there, or what she had done, curdled my blood. I knew the goddess needed us, but what if she changed her mind? I didn't want us to suffer the same fate as Twilight Sparkle. There's a hospital a few miles from here, Calamity announced, surprising us all. Part of the gem mine in town that served this place. When they shut down the mines, the town was abandoned, but they opened parts of it back up to house the ponies who worked at Maripony and their families. I didn't ask how he knew any of this. Calamity had been surviving in the equestrian wasteland for years before we had met. Who knew what rumors and scraps of information he had learned? I was content to just be thankful for this change in our luck. Another shot struck the wall I was hiding behind, causing it to glow and melt. I scooted my tail to another bit of cover. We weren't going anywhere until they stopped taking so many pot shots in our direction. And there should probably be plenty of rooftops to hide out on while I heal, Calamity assured us. Ain't perfect, but probably the safest place from the Hailhounds, if we can get there. We all knew we were talking about several miles travel over Hellhound-infested, irradiated, and taint-soaked landscape. Just point the way, Calamity, I said, sounding more sure than I felt. I have a plan. You always do, Calamity grinned. Just get us to Old One, and we'll be fine. The Hellhounds seemed to lose interest after about an hour. It made me wonder if there was a larger purpose behind the attack, or if it had just been sport. I stood on the railing ringing Maripony's short water tower, my binoculars floating in front of my face. From here, I could just make out the shapes of Old Olne in the distance, resting peacefully. An elevated highway passed nearby, going nowhere. The highway had collapsed less than half a mile beyond the off-ramp to the town leaving a line of rubble and crushed wagons that time in the valley had mostly succeeded in erasing. Turning my gaze towards the horizon, I glimpsed a shadow that may have been Ponyville. Beyond that, the sky turned hazy and thick from the smoke of the ever-free fires. Walking around the rim, I realized I could spot three of those needle-like towers rising in the cloudy heavens above. I was fairly sure that one of them was the same one I had spotted from the outskirts of Cloudsdale, but I hadn't seen the others before. Coming full circle, I looked back again at Old Olney, then traced the path we would travel by to get there. A set of train tracks that stretched from Old Olney to Maripony, crossing rocky flatland with only minor undulations, save for a gulch filled with hints of scraggly vegetation and sick stagnant water. I couldn't make out any details, but the plants beneath the bridge moved as if there was much stronger wind blowing down the gulch rather than the faint breeze that stirred my mane. My view turned black as an alicorn flew across my narrow scope of vision, obscuring the landscape. I put away the binoculars, hurrying back down. More alicorns were beginning to return. The ones already here had returned to their silent lurking, seeming to pay us no attention. I was expecting either the goddess or her alicorns to attempt another escort, but it was almost as if they had forgotten we were here. Yet that was impossible. They kept looking right at us. Maybe the goddess was gauging what we would do next. Or maybe she was recovering. She had lost quite a few of her children over the space of an hour. I wasn't the only one who found this behavior bizarre. Howdy, Calamity said, trotting shakily up to one of the dark purple alicorns and waving a hoof in her face. Remember us? The ponies y'all want to find your stuff for you? Got a hurt wing here. If one of y'all would care to hit yourself up, we can all be out of your mane that much faster. He turned to me, 
wobbling a little from the last fading effects of the anesthetic spell. This is weird, right? Maybe the goddess is taking a great and powerful nap, Xanath suggested. Calamity snorted a laugh that ended in a wince. Hey, Zenith, Calamity suddenly announced. I never said it, but I wanted to tell y'all, I'm glad you're free and all. Merciful Celestia, Calamity. Awkward much? Zenith looked at him quietly, then simply said, Thank you. Calamity chewed on that, then tried again. So, those potions you brew, any of them good for strength and armor, or helping with equipment maintenance? No, Zenith answered. Seeming to understand his intentions, she offered politely. I do know many poisonous brews should you be looking to make your bullets more lethal. I felt for him. He was trying to connect with the new member of our group. He had been the most welcoming of her, trusting my judgment. But since then, they hadn't really bonded in quite the way Zenith and Velvet Remedy had, or even established the sort of relationship. Would rivalry be the best word? Grudging respect? That Zenith and Steelhoofs shared. They were friendly acquaintances, and I suspected Calamity was trying to find a better way to turn that into one true friendship. Calamity trotted around the alicorn. She turned lethargically, keeping him in her sight. I'm tempted to start shooting him. Take out as many as we can. Velvet shot him a look of alarm, and he backed down with a grin. I didn't say I was gonna. I just said I was tempting. Zenith shook her head. We should make the most of this respite to implement the little one's plan without interference. I floated Calamity's enclave armor out of the Sky Bandit, as well as Spitfire's Thunder and our other vital equipment. I didn't want anyone trotting up to it when the area around the passenger wagon could still be mined. As I placed our equipment in the center of a large hunk of capsized wall, Velvet called us to gather close. Pilot landed on her back, puffing herself up and looking important. As a precaution, Velvet was going to cast another ward against disintegration upon us. I had been watching Calamity when his orb burst, but I hadn't realized the ones over the rest of us had disappeared simultaneously. I can cast the spell over multiple friends, Velvet explained as she recast the spell. But it collapses after any of you are hit. So please be dears and try not to get shot. She turned towards me. Especially you. I really hate this idea. You are too vulnerable. Why is it that you're always the one put in the most danger, little Pip? But she knew the answer. We'd been over this before. All my friends gathered on the slab of concrete as I wrapped them and it in a field of levitation. Velvet turned to help Calamity into the Enclave armor, being extremely careful with his partially mended wing. She was wearing the zebra armor again, insisting we minimize the risks as much as possible. Particularly since Little Pip seems insistent on taking more than her fair share. I floated the chunk of Mariponi's wall upward, not stopping until it was at least four stories above me. I was counting on the concrete to shield them from the Hellhound's magical energy weapons. I understood Velvet Remedy's concern, but this time it couldn't be helped. My telekinetic magic had grown powerful enough that I could float this large section of the wall and all of them on it easily, but adding myself to the mix would create such a strain that I would be lucky to make it halfway without suffering burnout. I agreed to light myself enough to prevent my hoofsteps from triggering mines or announcing my presence to any hellhounds who might be lurking just beneath the surface, but that was all. In the end, Velvet Remedy had to accept it. It had to be me. I started forward, moving around the ruins of Mariponi. The slab of wall with my friends on it floated along high above me. While I would not say as much, I was grateful to be able to take the risk in their place. Was this something corrupted kindness would do? As soon as I had the thought, I pushed it out of my mind. I couldn't afford self-doubts right now. As I reached the cracked edge of the Mariponi base, I hesitated. My pit buck was click-clicking, warning me of the radiation. But there was no sound. No special display in my EFS designed to warn me of taint. Old Olney suddenly felt a very long way away. Splotches of red on my EFS compass alerted me to more threats. I floated the zebra rifle close and slipped into sats even as I trotted. I was pacing myself. Advice from the book, The Egghead's Guide to Running, that I perused in Twilight Sparkle's Athenium during one of the hours where Homage was playing DJ Pony and giving me a chance to catch my breath. I had several miles to go, and I wanted to make the distance as quickly as possible, which surprisingly meant not pushing myself as fast as I could. 
A spiny dart hit my side, bouncing harmlessly off my armored utility barding. My targeting spell latched onto the first bloat sprite, then the second. I fired off a three-round burst at each, and the taint-swollen bugs erupted in flame as they fell to the ground. I continued to trot along the tracks, quickening my pace just a little to make up for the seconds lost while shooting. The wall holding my friends floating high above me, keeping place. We were nearing the gulch. My skin was beginning to itch in strange places. I fretted, wondering if it was nerves or an allergic reaction. Or worse, the first symptoms of taint. My EFS compass was filled with red. Dozens of little lights appeared. Then more. The gulch was swarming with hostile life. I trotted onto the tracks and prepared to break into a gallop, hoping that the rather rickety wooden bridge would offer me protection. Something bobbed up over the edge of the gulch. I shuddered, staring at the taint-mutated thing. It looked like a plant, its huge head covered in gas sacks that allowed it to float, the stalk drooping down and dragging behind it. A sphincter in the center of its head tightened and then spit foul goop at me. The spore-laden effluent splattered on the ground near my hooves, sending up a choking stink. The equestrian wasteland never seemed to run out of new vileness. Several nearly identical floating spitter plants were moving up and out the gorge towards me. I slipped into sats again, locking targets onto the closest two, sending two three-round bursts into the sphincter heads of each monster as a third sprayed its filth at me. I felt the crud splash against my armor and coat, burning where it touched and causing me to drop my targeting spells I gagged on the stench. The two floaters I had hit ignited spectacularly. The gas pods that gave them mobility rupturing in flame like the miniature versions of Pinkie Pie balloons. Three more of the floating spitter plants rushed up from the gulch, one hitting the burning form of the first one and igniting explosively itself. The second spit its spore sewage at me while a third charged towards me, as if intending to latch on and devour. I cantered to the side, dodging the spit, and bucked Sats back up, targeting the charging one first, and then the one who had successfully hit me. Bullets burst from the silenced muzzle of the zebra rifle. The two targeted plants became flailing columns of fire, but the floaters kept coming. I dropped the targeting spell, and brought it back up immediately, targeting two more. One of the burning plants spit at me, its spore sewage now on fire. Mercifully, the burning crud splashed across the tracks behind me, missing by a yard. My skin was really beginning to hurt where I had been hit. I dropped out of sats again and shook, flinging the goop away from me. Then lifted the rifle and brought up the targeting spell, firing again at the advancing half-burning herd of plants. One of the burning floater plants tumbled back into the gulch. I could hear more gas bladders catching fire and bursting as a rapid chain reaction quickly set several hundred yards of the gulch ablaze. I sprinted, galloping across the wooden bridge as flames from the gulch began to lick at it. Fierce heat and a choking reek buffeted me as I forced myself across, my eyes stinging. Several of the plants in the conflagration below spit burning spore sewage at me. Most hit the bridge, setting it properly ablaze. Burning effluent struck my left flank, my hind leg and saddlebags catching on fire. I bit down, knowing that a scream could bring hellhounds. I pushed, running as hard as I could, my leg in searing pain. I was pouring concentration into levitating the wall now, the physical agony threatening to break my spell. The fire was spreading up my side, and it hurt to breathe. Flames licked at my hooves, burning them. I did scream. I was almost across the burning bridge, the gulch below a writhing river of fire, when the hellhound tore out of the ground, alerted by my scream. But he was far enough ahead of me that Calamity could target him from the platform above. Four blasts of magical energy knifed down from above, melting the hellhound into a colored sludge. I began to lower the wall, choking on the smoke and the stench of my own burning coat, knowing I wouldn't be able to hold it much longer. It was three yards above the ground when the pain overwhelmed me and I dropped it. I made it to the end of the bridge in a stumbled gallop and collapsed, rolling on the ground, squirming as I put out the fire on my left flank, screaming. Just get to Old Olney and everything will be fine, Zenith chimed, her exotic voice taking on a mocking tone as she peered at the town below through my binoculars. We had made it to the top of the overpass and were looking down Old Olney from above. From here, we could see dozens of hellhounds lurking about the town. A couple were even on rooftops. God dang it, why do you ponies ever listen to me? Calamity asked. I ain't little pip. Y'all know all my plans ain't worth shit. 
I flopped over, telekinetically floating the monoculars to my eyes. I still couldn't feel anything. Velvet Remedy's anesthetic spell doing its work. But that didn't prevent me from using my levitation spell. In fact, it almost made it easier. I had spent the second half making myself light enough for Pylite to carry while I floated the others in the wall behind us. The older unicorn had wasted no time in wrapping me with the rest of our medical bandages as she scolded me on taking yet another gruesome attack for the team. But with the pain gone, and out of the choking smoke, I felt assured I had done the right thing. There was something wrong with me. I could feel it where the spit hit me. Something crawling beneath my skin that even Velvet's spell couldn't cover. I had floated my own forehoof so I could check my pit buck's medical diagnosis spell. It confirmed that I was suffering from... something but it couldn't determine what something was. It wasn't poison, and I checked clean for spore infestation. No, the spore sewage of those floating plants had been laced with taint. I had never believed I could make the distance without exposure to taint. I had never been that lucky. Rather, it would be a matter of how much exposure, and how quickly taint took its toll. I knew that the society keeping Tenpony's Tower as secrets possessed a spell that could purge taint itself although I didn't know if it could reverse the damage caused by it. That would be my hope. The ruins of Old Olney included several nearly intact buildings, one of which was the hospital. Sitting on the roof was a contraption I had never seen before, colored like a pink and yellow candy cane with periwinkle propeller blades fixed to the top. What's that? I asked, pointing it out. I believe that's an Earth Pony Skywagon, Calamity said. Trust it to an earth pony to find a way to fly. I could use that. No more running on the ground as I levitated others in safety. Do you think it still works? I asked, hopefully. Nope, Calamity said, deflating my daydream of floating everyone behind me while I was keeping safely off the ground in the earth pony contraption. But then he added, But I bet I can fix her up so she will. Hope resurrected. Perfect because that's our plan B. I looked over the rest of the town, noting a strange glowing antenna array amongst multiple crates and barricades on a roof across the street from the hospital and a scattering of old military vehicles on the road. There was a capsized wagon with metal boxes scattered around it and a heavy tank half sunken into the ground. Instead of a normal earth tone or camouflage coloration, the tank had been painted in bright multicolored stripes. The paint job was old and faded, but still added a surprising splash of color to the town. I laughed. That tank looks like rainbow. I could think of no logical reason for it to be colored that way. Really? Is that what they look like? Zenith asked. At my question, she explained. I have never seen a rainbow. At first, I found the zebra's assertion impossible, then tragically sad, and finally curious. I looked up at the clouds that sealed off the sky. I'd seen it rain here. I'd seen it rain a lot, in fact. But I had never seen a rainbow outside. Except in posters and illustrations, that is. In fact, the only real rainbows I'd ever seen were in Stable 2, when the apple orchard sprayers were on. The Overmare's artificial sunlight would stream through the mist, creating shimmering arcs of beautiful color. I used to beg my mother to let me play in them when I was younger. She even let me once. Yep, Calamity said in answer to my thoughts. To get a real rainbow, you need either magic or direct sunlight. Ain't been a proper rainbow in the Equestrian Wastelands probably ever. He thought a moment, then added. Except maybe in the Everfree Forest, since the cloud cover gets mighty fragmented there. I exchanged looks with Velvet Remedy as the knife slipped into my heart. I had never thought to miss them until I realized we were living in a world without rainbows. I'm going to shoot him, Calamity announced before picking up Spitfire's thunder in his teeth and aiming it over the concrete railing of the overpass, taking aim for one of the hellhounds in the town below. No, hissed Zenith, pushing Spitfire's thunder with her hoof. If you shoot them, then you will let them know where we are. Wait, Velvet Remedy started to suggest, but my focus was on Calamity and Zenith, and their focus was on each other. Calamity started to say something through the gun bit, then put the weapon down to properly argue. Yep. I think I can pick a couple off before they realize where the shots are coming from. Then more as they come out of those buildings to investigate. Let them come running towards us. 
We got plenty of space between here and there to snipe them off in. I was already pulling out my own sniper rifle, levitating my anesthetized body into an optimal sniping position. Little Pip, wait, Velvet said, but her words were cut off by our zebra companion. Are you fools? Zenith trotted in place. This is not how you behave in enemy territory. Our enemy outnumbers us, and these are not stupid raiders, but clever opponents. You do not engage them wantonly. Calamity cocked his head. And what would you have us do? Hide and sneak? Yes. Zenith nodded firmly. Be alert. Move fast. Keep downwind into the shadows. Avoid them whenever possible. Kill only those we cannot avoid, and do so swiftly and silently. Calamity looked to me. I say take out what we can, while we can do so from a distance. Less of them means less to worry about fighting up close. Zenith sighed, stepping between Calamity and me, facing him. Listen to me. I have watched you. You are a hunter. You know how to hunt. But do you know how to be the prey? Calamity took a step back, lifting the bug-eyed visor of his enclave armor to stare back at her directly. I ain't got no interest in being prey. Well, I have spent most of my life as prey, and I know how to survive when you are outnumbered and chased, Zenith informed him. Perhaps you should listen. Calamity again looked past her to me. Lil Pip, see a call. Zenith turned towards me too. I weighed the options, but ultimately, the tactics I knew won out. I agree with Calamity. We pick off what we can now before heading in. I floated up the sniper rifle, loading armor-piercing rounds and taking aim. From this distance, I couldn't use my targeting spell to help me, but I had no trouble lining up a headshot just through the scope. Zenith nickered, shaking her head. Calamity picked up Spitfire Slender off the asphalt of the overpass and took position twenty yards away from me. Damn it, wait! I heard Velvet Remedy shout. But I'd already pulled the trigger. Blam. Blam. The air filled with the sound of ear-splitting thunder as we began to fire down on Old Olney. I watched as the head of the hellhound in my sights burst into a bloody spray. I moved to acquire my next target. The hellhounds were all looking up now, turning, beginning to move. I found a second and fired, but the creature moved too fast. I aimed ahead of him, firing a second shot, and then a third. I was no longer able to aim for a specific part of the body. I was just hoping to hit them at all. My second shot did but only slowed him down. The third missed entirely. I kept trying. Several shot back, beams of magical energy cutting through the air, but we were too far away and too well protected by the overpass to be in danger from anything other than a dedicated sniper. Calamity was having far better luck. Every shot hit its target, crippling or killing. He started picking off the ones in the street as I turned my focus to those just coming out of the doorways. That worked better. I felt a second, and a third. Oh, crap. Calamity hissed as the hellhound he had turned his aim on dove into the ground, digging through the street like it was wet toilet paper. Calamity fired, blowing the creature's tail off as it disappeared. They weren't coming out of the doors anymore, and as I looked up, I saw the last of the hellhounds on the street disappear into a hole. We had killed ten of them. Well, brilliant. Velvet Remedy face-hoofed. Both of you. Now, they know we're here, and we've attacked them first. She looked cross. Calamity wiggled his wounded wing. My wing disagrees. Velvet Remedy's ears drooped. Now, Zenith told Calamity, you are prey. We are all prey. They came for us on the overpass while I was still paralyzed by the anesthetic spell. The hellhounds weren't foolish enough to come running up on the ramp like we hoped. Instead, they dug their powerful claws into the pier beneath us and began to climb. The first one clawed its way over the railing almost on top of us. Pyrolite was the fastest to react, filling it with a face full of radioactive green flame. Calamity recovered quickly, firing two of the Nova Surge rifles and his enclave armor directly into the hellhound's torso as it lashed out with its claws, barely missing the Balefire Phoenix. The monster tilted back, dissolving. They're coming up from beneath us, 
Zenith warned before turning to dig in her satchel. Velvet Remedy cooed to Pyrolite. Would you please burn them off of the pier? Pyrolite hooted happily and leapt over the edge. I could hear the roar of flames beneath. Pyrolite was able to take out two of them before more on the ground abandoned climbing and started shooting at her. She appeared, dodging and weaving between shots as the magical energy attacks drove her away from the overpass and the pony she was protecting. Zenith produced a bottle and passed it to Velvet Remedy. Dip your slugs into this before you load them, she instructed. The poison will cripple the creatures if your shot isn't enough to kill them. Velvet Remedy opened her combat shotgun, floating out the slugs and dipping them as instructed, a grim look on her face. Two more crawled over the railing. I was ready this time, floating up little Macintosh as I slipped into sats and fired into their heads. The hellhound's brain splashed out of the exit wounds. Three more replaced the two I had just killed. And the sound of rending concrete warned me that more were digging directly up through the overpass from the top of the pier. Velvet Remedy's anesthetic spell hit one of the hellhounds, causing the creature to fall. She lifted her shotgun towards another, and hesitated. The hellhound lashed out at her, his claws slashing shallow lines of red across her breast and throat as I telekinetically shoved her back. Surrender, she offered to the creature. Don't make me hurt you. God dang it, Calamity shouted, firing a bevy of magical energy bolts into the hellhound. The creature collapsed into a steaming puddle leaving Velvet Remedy and Calamity staring at each other through the rising smoke. Don't reason with them. They ain't interested. They're people, she shouted back. They have a right to live. Y'all heard the zebra, Calamity shouted, turning to fire at another hellhound as he dug up through the overpass asphalt. They're hunting us. And whose fault is that? She quipped back loudly, throwing a protective shield around Zenith. The hellhound's claws tore through Velvet's shield like it was made of colored air. The zebra stepped inside the attack, rising on her hind legs and throwing up one hoof to stop the monster's swinging arm, while driving another hoof against the thick hide of his throat. The hellhound collapsed, choking. Has any pony ever tried just talking to them? Velvet cried out in exasperation. I reloaded Little Macintosh as quickly as I could. They were coming faster now. It was getting harder to put them down as quickly as they surfaced. One good swipe from their claws would kill any of us. There were bloody hellhound corpses and piles of sludge all around us. We'd killed nearly ten more, miraculously without being crippled or killed. Even if Velvet Remedy had a point, it was far too late now. I told her so as I fired point blank at a hellhound and somehow missed. The creature bore down on me with its claws. Velvet Remedy sang a single high-pitched note. The hellhound immediately backed away, its clawed paws covering its ears. It turned and fled down the hole it had just come out of so fast I didn't have time to bring up my targeting spell and shoot at its back. Velvet continued to hold the note, clear and strong. I looked around and the other hellhounds were disappearing, fleeing the overpass. Once they were all gone, Velvet's voice finally broke. Panting, she fixed us all with a glower. Savage animals and monsters are one thing. But with people, there's usually a way that doesn't require killing each other. We moved cautiously into Old Olney. The sun was beginning to set, and I wanted to get into the hospital and out again before the coming darkness put us at an even greater disadvantage. We were taking Zenith's advice now, not engaging, moving swiftly and quietly. Of the group of us, only Velvet Remedy was unskilled at stealth, so I floated her along with us. The faint glow coming up from my horn and shining around her worried me. It was like I was painting her as a target. But from our experiences, it seemed the hellhounds hunted by sound more than sight, possibly by scent as well, so it felt more important to keep our hooves off the ground. As we pushed through the remains of a building, I spotted several pony-shaped figures laying on a floor above us through a collapsed section of ceiling. I waved a hoof at the others. Hold up. I want to take a look. I floated myself upwards, sweating with the effort, my horn glowing brighter. There were no red marks on my EFS compass, no sign of life on the floor above at all, so I felt momentarily safe in pushing myself. As I levitated through the hole, I could see the bodies were of steel rangers, three of them clad in metal armor and a fourth who was not. The fourth sparked my curiosity. A yellow unicorn mare wearing thickly armored red robes with the sparks and gear symbol of the steel rangers embroidered onto it. 
I had not seen a ranger wearing anything other than the steel ranger armor, save for Elder Blueberry Saber. All four of them had died from terrible wounds inflicted by Hellhound Claws. The bodies were desiccated. They had been here for quite some time. The Hellhounds had mined the floor around the bodies. One by one, I disarmed them. I began scavenging the bodies, searching for any clues as to what brought these four to Old Olne, as well as any supplies or ammo that might benefit us. I was in luck. The robed pony had two stealth bucks and a memory orb. One of the other rangers had magically enchanted ammunition that was of the same caliber as Calamity's normal battle saddle. I brought my treasures back to the others. You ain't planning on looking into that oil bar here in Old Olne, right? Calamity said with a gentle warning. Y'all remember our little talk, don't you? I nodded solemnly. I Pinkie Pie swear. You what now? Never mind, I'll tell you later. And yes, I promise. As we moved to the edge of the street, my EFS warned me that there were at least four hellhounds around the corner. I halted everyone. We might be able to take them. We had surprise. But it would only take one good swipe from them to behead one of us. And the fight would draw others. No. We would continue to follow Zenith's advice. I motioned everyone back the other way. I hate this. Calamity muttered in a whisper. I want to hunt the hunters, not play these scurrying games. I ain't a rabbit. Zenith gave a wry smile. Humility does not come easy to you, does it? Calamity turned to her. What's that supposed to mean? You say I'm a show-off? She wouldn't be entirely wrong, would she? Velvet Remedy purred with just the right tone to soothe and embarrass the Pegasus. The partially collapsed firehouse tilted at an insane angle, making the entire world seem alien and threatening. Calamity, Velvet, and I scrambled across the maze of broken floors and leaning columns. Pyrolites sweeped between the floors, occasionally diving down to the bright red firehouse wagons that lay crushed and partially buried under the swaths of flooring. A hellhound lurched on the doorway behind us, only to find Zenith waiting for it. A swift blow beneath the ribs froze the creature in place, paralyzing it. As it fell, a bolt of magical energy shot through the doorway, striking the zebra in the throat. She glowed brightly and the orbs over our heads burst. Zenith fell, bleeding from a wound in her throat the size of a memory orb. Velvet Remedy struck the monster with an anesthetic spell, then rushed to Zenith, floating out her dress and using it to apply pressure to the wound. The dress was quickly ruined as it soaked with blood. Can I please kill him? Calamity huffed. Velvet frowned, not saying anything. Zenith rasped. Yes, silently, and cut them open to blood smell. The hellhounds were hunting us, tracking us now clearly by scent. I understood what Zenith intended, as did Calamity. Velvet Remedy turned away, unwilling or unable to watch as we slew the two hellhounds. We made it quick, merciful. It was the least we could do, considering that we were about to defile their bodies. This ends any chance of diplomacy, Velvet moaned. I hesitated, floating a jagged piece of sheet metal out of the debris and positioning it over the hellhound's body. I had to disembowel him, spread his stink, cover our path with the stench of his death. It was vile. Slowly, I lowered the jagged metal, slashing at the hellhound's armored hide, slowly sawing into him. It was incredibly hard and the reek was unbearable. I took what little comfort I could in at least knowing he had died quickly and without pain. Corrupted kindness, the little pony in my head whispered in the voices of the goddess. Please. No. By the time I was done, I felt sick to my stomach. I'd killed plenty, but this made me feel like a raider. My mind conjured up the image of myself, bleeding, wearing raider armor. The image from the magical mirror. There were bathrooms on the floor above, and medical boxes in each of them. Cracked mirrors and shattered toilets leaned at crazy angles. The whole tilt of the building was making me nauseous, even more than I already was from the grisly work before. My pit buck complained as I got close enough to the sink for it to scan the contents of what little plumbing remained functional. The levels of radiation in the water here rivaled and usually exceeded the levels in Philadelphia. I sat back, 
braced against the wall and picked the lock on the medical box in the little mare's room. The lock clicked open with ease. I opened it, emptying the box of its meager medical supplies and adding them to the supplies from the medical box in the little buck's room. Nothing that would help with Calamity's wing, but the small healing poultice would close and heal Zenith's wound. The wasteland sometimes gave small favors. I pushed myself up, feeling unsteady on the canted floor, and hurried back to the others. They were gathered in what had once been the firehouse kitchen. Velvet Remedy took the poultice and applied it, then borrowed a needling thread from Calamity's clothing repair kit. A cabinet two buildings back had offered up an old bottle of apple whiskey, half empty. I whimpered inside as the drink went to sterilizing the needle. I could use a sip. I contented myself with a drought from my last canteen. It was nearly empty. I itched in ways I shouldn't itch. The poultice had stopped the bleeding and partially closed the gaping wound in Zenith's neck. Velvet began to sew the wound closed completely. Even with Velvet's expert attentions, the wound was going to remain an ugly scar for the rest of her life. I realized, not for the first time, that the zebra would be dead if the magical bolt had struck her just an inch differently. Now, you wait here and rest, Velvet ordered the zebra mare. And Little Pip, you watch her. I'm taking Calamity to find something to use as rags to clean you butchers off. Velvet stuck her nose in the air and trotted out. Calamity scowled but followed, pausing next to me long enough to remind me. Remember, no orbs. I watched him walk out after her. Rags. Sounded more like an excuse to talk to Calamity alone. I let out a long sigh. <sighs> Worst day ever. It wasn't. But ever since we entered Splendid Valley, the day had been working very hard at becoming so, reaching a lunatier rating of badness. Zenith lay still for almost a full minute before getting up and moving about the kitchen. She had to brace herself on sloping counters as she rifled through the cabinets. Well, at least you're as good as following doctor orders as the rest of us. I chuckled as the zebra started pulling pots out and setting them on the table. One of them slid down the incline. I caught it magically before it hit the floor. Zenith, I asked, a worry from the days before flooding back. Do you trust me? Without turning from her task, she replied by asking, Trust you about what? It was a dodge, but still a fair question. Do you trust me as a person? No, she said simply. Should I? I was taken back by the cool, honest answer. Why not? You are impulsive and have difficulty controlling your urges she said as she opened the refrigerator door and pulled out a hunk of something covered in grotesquely mutated mold. She set it on the table and I caught it as it tried to slide away, recoiling from the sight of it. You are a very quick thinker and equally swift to act, she continued, crouching to check the lower drawers. This makes you adaptable, perhaps more than any pony or zebra I have ever known. It allows you to improvise where others would be paralyzed, but it also leads you to rash actions from hasty decisions and gets you in trouble as often as it gets you out of it. She finally pulled a knife from one of the drawers. She set it on the counter. I caught it, too, as she turned to look at me. Although, these are just my observations, and I have not known you for very long. She looked me over. Why do you ask? I wasn't sure what to feel. I wanted to argue with her, but a large part of me suspected she was right, and I cursed her for being so observant. Do you think I'm evil? Zenith stopped, looking at me oddly, then laughed. No, little one. You are one of the most caring souls I have ever met, pony or otherwise. Again, the little pony in my head whispered corrupted kindness in the voices of the goddess. Do you think I'm cursed, then? At her odd expression, I clarified. I have been touched by homage. The zebra turned back to scouring the kitchen, pulling pans out of a lower drawer to get at a spark battery-powered hot plate. Oh, of that I am quite aware. I felt myself flush nervously. Well, what do you mean by that? There are lovers who are quiet, and there are ones who are not, Zenith stated. You are not one of the quiet ones. 
Oh, no, dear sweet Celestia. You are what my tribe called a winnie I felt myself blushing hotly. I wanted to throw myself into the splendid valley sinkhole out of sheer embarrassment. You mean... all those... each... I squeaked. Yes, Xanath confirmed. Each. It took me several minutes and an old sack that the zebra had given me before I stopped hyperventilating. Can you breathe now? Xanath asked gently. I nodded. I think so. The medical pony is right, Xanath said with a soft smile. You are cute when you are that color. I felt faint, my breathing threatening to quicken again. I took a moment and composed myself as best as I could. So, am I cursed, because I love homage? She paused, then turned away. I waited for her to answer. The answer I received was not what I had expected. The zebras may have been wrong about Nightmare Moon, she admitted. You ponies may have been right. The wielders of the elements of harmony may have broken whatever hold the stars had over Nightmare Moon. Luna may have been different. She turned to me. But that does not mean that the touch of the stars was not still upon her, that it did not influence her in more subtle ways. She looked to me. I am open to your beliefs, but I ask that you be open to mine. Perhaps there is truth in both. I frowned. I didn't want there to be any truth in her beliefs. But I had seen things that suggested otherwise. Things that suggested maybe there was something dark and terrible up there in the vast emptiness that stretched beyond the moon. But homage isn't evil. She's not twisted. She is no nightmare moon, I insisted. In fact, she saved our lives. She saved yours. Zenith nodded with a sad smile. And you would say it was quite an amazing shot. Absolutely. It was an... What? The weapon from the stars wants to kill, Zenith said. It yearns to kill. Okay, now that was just creepy. I will accept that homage is a good, kind pony, and that she is not cursed. But you ask me to, Zenith conceded. Even though I do not trust your judgment, I believe you speak truthfully in this. And I suspect you are better experienced at matters of the heart than I am. I smiled, feeling a touch of relief. Thank you, Zenith. The zebra shook her head. But I ask in return that you keep an open mind to the things I believe, and a watchful eyes for warning signs. The stars take the greatest delight in giving us the means to destroy ourselves and each other. Do you truly think that your relationship has not changed now that she has taken a life for you? I felt a chill. I had not considered that before. Or, if I had, I had seen the consequences of being entirely beneficial. She had saved my life. How would that not bring us closer? But had I not, that very night, wept in front of her for having killed a steel ranger? Regardless of whether Zenith's superstitious fears were justified, she had led me to re-examine what had happened in a less self-centered way. I looked up into the zebra's eyes. Thank you. I floated the whole array of pots and pans. Zenith had quickly discovered that no surface in the room was flat enough to safely cook on after a mishap with the hot plate. Not far outside, Calamity and Velvet Remini had started arguing. We could hear it from inside the kitchen, but could not make out the words. Not that I wanted to. Zenith fretted, worried that their discussion would attract more hellhounds, but so far they were keeping their voices low enough. Still, it added an unpleasantness to the air. I distracted myself by returning to an earlier part of my conversation with Zenith. Do you trust me to tell you the truth? Yes, little one, unless you believe it is in my best interest to lie. Crap. I hated to think she might be right about that. I would have preferred to be more like homage. But if it came to telling the truth or protecting my friends, I had a track record of choosing the latter. And while I regretted the necessity, it was rare for me to consider the choices. Did this mean that I was playing steel hooves to homage's Applejack? Well... Would you trust me with your life? I asked as Zenith took the knife and started scraping chunks of mold into one of the pots. She finished, 
then put the knife down. I caught it again. It is not a matter of trust. You saved my life. You are responsible for it. Ugh. More insane zebra logic. All the worse since it was insane, understandable zebra logic. I have not chosen to release you from that. Frustrated, I asked. Why not? Look where following me has gotten you. You nearly died. I've taken you from one hellhole straight into another. The zebra looked at me, a touch of sadness in her eyes, then turned away. She filled a pot with horribly irradiated water, then began to mix the mold into it, not answering me. I sat and watched. In the very least, maybe I would learn something. One by one, she added more ingredients, none of which looked healthy. I hoped this wasn't anything we were intended to consume. Don't talk, she said, although I wasn't talking at all anymore. Be quiet. Run. Hide. Her voice was low, heavy. Get you a food and hide, or a pony will take it from you. Don't talk. When they come for you, relax. Let them do what they will do. Don't fight. Don't scream. Don't talk. She looked up at the canted ceiling. When they hurt you, grunt. Whimper. Don't talk. Always the same. Until they get bored. Then hide. Heal. Prepare for the next time. She looked to me. If they move to kill you, kill them. Then hide the body. Hide it well. Find another place to be. Don't let them suspect you. Be meek. Don't talk. Hide. A cold shiver passed through me as I stared at the scarred zebra mare. It was only after a truly exceptional horror that I dared join the fights. I did not wish for them to see that I could fight, but I could no longer bear it. She lowered her head, looking to me with tears in her eyes. Before you, the slavers. Before the slavers, my husband. Before him, my parents. I have never owned myself. I am not comfortable with the idea. I know this role. I can survive it. I shook my mane. I may be responsible for you, as you say, but I am not a slaver. I do not own you. And for that, you are better than all the others, Zenith admitted. But still, the fact remains that I do not know how to live being responsible for myself. I think, I told her, you do just fine. The hallway tilted at such a nauseating angle that I was walking as much on the wall as the floor. I followed close to Calamity, keeping an eye on my eyes forward sparkle for hellhounds. We were hunters again at Zenith's request. Another one at our six, I whispered to him as the light appeared on my compass. Supply room, I think. I see it. Calamity nodded, reminding me that the bug-eyed style visor in his armor had an EFS of its own. Crouching low. The Pegasus moved stealthily forward until he was in position directly in front of the door, his four magical energy rifles pulsing eagerly. I telekinetically pushed open the door, holding it so gravity wouldn't swing it back shut. A skewering dart shot out of the supply room, bouncing harmlessly off the forehead of Calamity's black armor carapace. Huh, he chuckled, raising on his haunches and striking at the bloat sprite with the stinger of his armor's segmented scorpion tail. The impaled creature squealed as it died. <laughs> he said, chuckling. Ever wish these things could detect threat level instead of just threats? I almost wasted a lot of ammo on a bug. I smirked. Often. I turned back to our friends, motioning them forward. Velvet nodded and nudged Zenith, who was crouched and facing the other way, guarding our flank. My eyes forward sparkled tracked a friendly spot of light as pilots swooped in and out of rooms, searching for enemies to burn or rodents to eat. The Balefire Phoenix returned to drop the charred corpse of a small animal at Velvet Remedy's hooves. Oh, thank you, Velvet sang lusciously, stroking the bird's plumage with a gentle hoof. Pilot hooted and stretched out her wings fluttering off again. It boggled my mind. You know you're just encouraging her to keep doing that, right? And why wouldn't I? Velvet said sweetly. My little Pyrelite is a wonderful hunter just like she should be. 
Calamity gave a grumpy look in Zenith's direction. At least, I assumed it was a grumpy look. With my friend hidden inside that armor, I couldn't really tell. But his posture struck me as grumpy. I decided I preferred my friend out of that armor. It made him look mysterious and rather evil. And it put up a barrier between us that I didn't care for. I'd gotten used to it with steel hooves, but not being able to see Calamity's face just felt wrong. She is a bird of prey, after all, Velvet reminded us. Zenith eyed the charred corpse and shook her head, then cantered towards us, moving with surprising ease down the off-kilter hallway. Calamity flexed his injured wing, and I thought I heard him mutter. So it was on not so long ago. So, Calamity, I piped up, pulling his attention away. I had a question that needs a Pegasus's expertise. Shoot, little pip, he said, seeming to cheer me up. If I wanted to clear a large area of clouds, say, the area over Manhattan, say, just as a totally random example, the area above a megaspell chamber which requires sunlight to function, how could I do so without having the Enclave all over me? Calamity nickered. Oh no, what you planning now, little pip? Just theoretical. Yep, sure it is, he said, clearly not buying a word of it. Zenith moved up to the body of the bloat sprite. Perfect, she intoned, opening her satchel. Leaning down, she tore off its wings and spat them into the satchel. Now I must find a room to complete the brew. Zenith moved ahead, taking the lead again. Do I even want to know? Calamity said. From what I've seen go into it, I prefer not to. Returning to my question, Calamity informed me. Well, there's only one way to clear an area that big that fast, and that's with a sonic rain boom. The gears in my head started turning. Of course, the Enclave's response to that would be swift and deadly, but you might have clear skies for over an hour. He chuckled ruefully. Which, sad to say, requires a Pegasus capable of performing one, of which the Equestrian Wasteland has exactly zero. The gears ground to a stop. Damn. Sorry, little pip. Show off or not, that's one trick I ain't never been able to do. Very, very few Pegasus I can, and the Enclave keeps them real close. When the firehouse had started to topple, the building came to rest against the Maripony Mining Administration building. A cancelled firehouse window hung open about five feet from the opening of a shattered window on the opposite building. Just a hop, skip, and a jump, I told Calamity with a smile. I remembered wearing Enclave armor from riding Rainbow Dash's memory. It might look fearsomely heavy, but it was amazingly light. There was no reason Calamity couldn't do this easily. Calamity braced against the sloping floor. Easy to say for y'all who ain't never had to do something like this without your wings. He looked to me. If I fall, y'all ready to catch me, right? Just float him across. Zenith suggested from the opposite window, where she and Velvet Remedy were waiting. Yeah, Clamity agreed. I like that plan better. I rolled my eyes, then whispered to him. But which do you think will impress Velvet more? Clamity straightened up, shook his fears off, and galloped and leapt. He made it with five feet to spare. Show off. My turn. I looked down the sloping floor and across the gap to the opposite window sill. It wasn't even with this window, maybe two feet higher. I swallowed. In Clammy's defense, the tilted floor was throwing me off, too. I galloped forward, lightening myself at the last moment, after I had all the momentum I needed. I sailed across, smacking into Clammy's armored tail. See? He joked. I told you, nothing to it. I snickered and shook my head. The room was an open office space filled with desks and terminals, none of which had survived well. I checked my EFS and found red lights moving around us, probably on the floors below. I motioned the others to be quiet, and once again I levitated Velvet Remedy as we moved. As we passed the last of the desks, I noticed an orange and yellow book laying in an open waste bin. I floated it out, looking the book over. The Big Book of Boom announced the cover, adding beneath. The Dynamite Guide to Handling Explosives. Below that was a picture of the author, Red Three Hooves Runner, with a cartoon balloon saying, You better handle her right the first time, because she won't explode twice. 
The book was crammed full of notes and papers. I tucked it away to look over later. Underneath it was an audio recording. I downloaded it onto my pit buck and slipped my ear bloom into an ear. Surely Calamity wouldn't mind this. Listening to the recording wouldn't remove me from my surroundings. Mining Officer Torchwood to all concerned personnel. First order of business. We will be having a surprise inspection in two days. Every pony needs to be well rested and at the top of their game. Maripony Operations Overmare Sunny Days is authorized a half day tomorrow so that every pony can get plenty of rest and have their uniforms cleaned and starched. Any pony who uses this time to go to Ponyville and get drunk will not be allowed back into the Maripony facility or any operations building within Old Olney and will be docked one week's pay. Baskets, make sure you have proper headgear this time or you will find yourself no longer employed by Maripony Mining Company. Second order of business, Maripony Mining Company has increased demand for productivity. This means you can expect an increase in work hours of 20% with a corresponding 15% increase in your paychecks. Officers whose teams exceed the new quotient will receive a bonus. I cannot say what the bonus is, but I can let you know that the bonus will include ice cream. Likewise, we will be opening up several previously restricted tunnels to mining operations. The Maripony Mining Company assures you that these tunnels meet and exceed our minimum safety standards. Third order of business, there have been increased reports of trespass by relocated diamond dogs. Now, I don't know if this is a territorial pack mine thing or if they're just stupid, but if you find a diamond dog on Maripony property, you are to instruct the dog to leave. If the diamond dog refuses, use of sonic deterrents are permitted. Ask your team officers for the newest line in D4, diamond dog deterrent device, whistles, now with convenient neck wrapping loops. Fourth order of business. Thanks to Brickbane, we have had to reset our days without serious injury board back to zero. Thankfully, Brickbane will recover the use of most of her limbs. Remember, D4 neck wrapping loops should be kept short so that your whistle cannot dangle into mining machinery. Keep up the good work, every pony. I turned off the ear bloom. We had reached the stairwell, and my EFS had lit up with more hostels. Two hellhounds lurked visibly at the bottom of the stairs below. They were wearing makeshift armor, and one of them carried a magical energy minigun. There were more around the corner. One of them started sniffing. I motioned the others back and looked to Zenith. In theory, the potion she had brewed was altering our scent, making us smell like mold and bloat sprites. Still, going down to street level was out, unless Zenith thought now was the time to go on the offensive. The zebra shook her head. She slipped forward and started up the stairs towards the roof. If I remembered correctly, this would put us across the street from the hospital. I didn't think even Calamity could clear old Olney's main street with just a hop, skip, and a jump. What am I looking at? It was not the first time those words had come out of my mouth. A late evening wind moaned through old Olney, pulling at our manes and tails. A yard from my hooves was the lumpy puddle of sludge which had once been the Hellhound Sniper positioned on the rooftop of the Maripony Mining Administration Building. Clammy had fired on him the moment we burst out of the roof, liquefying the creature before it could attack or howl. A strange antenna sat in the center of the sagging rooftop, humming softly, surrounded by magical gemstones that radiated a soft blue light. Around the antenna were several tables, one of which was still intact and held a glowing terminal that faced away from us. The others had been clawed to shreds. Strange silvery boxes sat nearby, all but one of them similarly shredded. Hellhound claw marks sliced into the barricades that ringed the roof. There were several dead ponies up here, all of them pegasi, all wearing the same black carapace armor. Enclave scouting party? I asked Calamity. Our pegasus walked amongst the corpses. They were old, just dried and rotting flesh hanging on the bone. No, he said, looking up. This was a science team. Calamity trotted round the other side of the terminal. I have no idea what they'd be doing in Old Olney, or down at all for that matter. His voice was grim. But I aim to find out. I recalled what Amage had told me about the night she found the weapon from the stars. Joe Plu had suspected it was part of a Grand Pegasus Enclave experiment. Perhaps she had not been so wrong after all. Maybe I should try hacking it, I blurted out, wanting to see the secrets the terminal held. Calamity's armored head looked up, and he lifted the armor's visor. He chuckled. 
Be my guest, he said, stepping away and welcoming me to the terminal with a swing of his scorpion-like tail. But I don't think you'll be able to hack this one. Come on, Calamity. I laughed good-naturedly. I haven't met a terminal yet that I can't hack. I puffed myself up, taking that as a challenge. Y'all ain't never met an enclave terminal, Calamity said knowingly. I stuck out my tongue as I trotted over. Technology's all the same. This is me, remember? The little mare with the pit buck on her flank? Let me at it. I stopped as I caught sight of the terminal interface. It was made of a strange white substance that I couldn't identify. I reached out to touch it, and my hoof went right through it like there was nothing there. It was made of... clouds. What the fuck? Calamity laughed. I looked around. The Enclave supply boxes all had locks on them that were made of the same material, either white or a light shade of pink. I looked to him, demanding an explanation as the pony in my head ranted that this was not how things should be. Well, what did y'all expect Pegasi built stuff out of? There are whole cities up there built almost entirely out of clouds. I could feel him grinning behind that damn helmet. What? Did you believe only unicorn ponies had any magic of their own? I stopped, frustrated. The very idea of terminals and locks that I couldn't get into just because they were made of clouds was just... just wrong and unfair. The words of the goddess floated back to me with controls which can only be operated by a pegasus. Fuck. The Ministry of Awesome had built key control systems out of fucking clouds. Any pony other than a pegasus who attempted to operate the controls would find themselves clutching slightly damp air. A thought occurred to me. Is there anyone other than a pegasus who can operate a system with a cloud interface? Nope, Calamity said proudly, then swiftly took it back. Yep, uh, Griffin's can. So that's how Red-Eye was planning to get past that obstacle. And I knew how he was trying to get past the second. We were on the clock again. I sighed, tossing up my hoofs in exasperation, and trotted back to the others, letting Calamity work on hacking the terminal. Instead, I moved to the edge of the building. I floated out my binoculars and looked across the street at the hospital. It looked shaken. There were massive cracks running up the walls and one of the corners had collapsed. A sign. A yellow cross with a pink butterfly in the center had started to pull free from the wall two stories up. The upper bolts had torn from the wall, and the whole sign hung precariously over the street below. Most of the windows were shattered, and the winds of Old Olney whipped its stained hospital curtains. Even still, it was one of the most intact buildings in Old Olney, and it was our best hope for the medical supplies we needed to fix Calamity's wing. I looked across the rooftop. I could see the Earth Pony flying contraption clearly with its candy-colored paint job lit up by the setting sun, the name Griffin Chaser 2 emblazoned on the side. It looked in sore disrepair, but I trusted Calamity's expertise. I looked down to the main road of Old Olney, a main street with a set of train tracks running down the center. Hellhounds scampered about, moving from one building to another in packs, hunting us. And night was falling. I was staring at the spikes that adorned the top of a wrought iron gate. They were ugly things, painful looking. I nodded my horn towards one of them, and the metal glowed with my beautiful blue magic, reshaping itself instantly into a happily prancing mare. I sent a prayer of thanks to Celestia and Luna. I was in a unicorn mare. It felt good and right. Even better, I was in sunlight. Perhaps the brightest, cleanest sunlight yet. The air was dusty but clean reminding me yet again how odd the air of the real world was. I turned my eyes to the next one and wove my magical spell over it. This became a prancing unicorn stallion. I was struck by how much it resembled Prince Blueblood, almost a perfect likeness. The next spike glowed and transformed into a unicorn mare, head bent as she was in mid-charge, her horn aimed dangerously close to Prince Blueblood's. Behave yourself, Rarity. I heard myself whisper in Rarity's lovely voice. The blue glow of magic surrounded the two figures again, and they were transformed into two entirely different, happy, and generic pegasi. I felt a strange thrill as I realized who I was, followed by a flash of guilt. That old spell, huh? came a voice from directly behind me. I turned, 
the blue pegasus with the shockingly rainbow-colored mane moving into view. It's not polite to sneak up on ponies, Rainbow Dash. I wasn't sneaking, the pegasus said defensively. I was flying. It's not my fault flying is quiet. Rainbow Dash was wearing the purple and black uniform I had seen her in before. So what have they got you all the way out in this dustbin for? Rarity looked around, and I was treated to the sight of Old Olney, intact and well-maintained and bustling with ponies. I was able to see the shops and homes that I had only known as ruins. And yet, as glorious as this look into the past was, I was clearly not seeing Old Olney in its heyday. Most of the shops were boarded up. There was a sense of disuse hanging over much of the town, and the bulk of the ponies were clearly either military or associated with the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. Apparently, Rarity said ruefully, they're having trouble with the Diamond Dogs again. Fluttershy has tried to talk to them, but it didn't work. So some pony thought they might pay more attention if I were to talk to them instead. Gee, Rainbow Dash snickered, I wonder why. Why indeed? Did Fluttershy tell them this wasn't their home anymore? Rainbow Dash asked, hovering in the air in front of me. Or you know that it's dangerous? Of course she did, Rarity said. Fluttershy even tried to compromise. Oh, brother. Rainbow Dash face hoofed. But that was when they discovered that Twilight's magical... My host searched for the best word. Byproducts, shall we say, have started eating through the barrels. Sunny lost a pony trying to move them when several tore open like they were made of nothing but the covering paint. I watched this look Rainbow Dash up and down. You know, I still can't believe you're wearing that. Hey, we're Luna's elite aerial force. What else are we going to call ourselves? How about anything other than the Shadow Bolts? Rarity suggested primly. Way I see it, why not play into the zebra's crazy nightmare moon phobia? The original Shadow Bolts were all just nightmare moon, right? Rainbow Dash grinned conspiratorially. Why not use that to our advantage? Every zebra who sees us coming and flees the battlefield is one less zebra we'll have to kill, or one that might kill us. Still, I can never get used to seeing you like that. Actually, Rainbow Dash put a hoof behind her head, brushing her mane. I had an idea about that. Do you think your old dressmaking skills are up to working with armor? The Pegasus ribbed. Rainbow Dash, you wound me. Oh, came a shout from somewhere on my host's left. A moment later, a dusty pony in a military uniform galloped to a stop and offered a salute to Rainbow Dash. Rarity stepped back. At ease, uh... Dash looked at the pony's uniform. Tank commander? Torchwood, ma'am. Big fan. Followed your career since the Wonderbolts. Rainbow Dash's face brightened. Oh, really? Did you see him at the gallops last year? My host shook her head. I see you're going to be busy for a while, Dash. I'll catch up with you later. She said graciously, even though it was the Pegasus who had sought her out. Do you think you'll be free by dinner? Rainbow Dash turned back. Oh yeah, no problem. I just want to throw some ideas past you. I could feel Rarity smiling. Also, Rainbow Dash added, swooping close and whispering, I heard a rumor that you're working on a new spell with the Ministry of Peace. Something about keeping a pony alive and awake indefinitely. Suspended animation, yes. Although that's a very poor description of it. Rarity replied, nodding. And I'm working on it for them, not with them. Part of a private line of research that has finally borne some fruit. But it still needs some fine-tuning. Dash grinned. Great, because that sounds like just what I've been looking for. Rarity raised an eyebrow. Dare I ask? Uh, just part of the single Pegasus project. I could feel Rarity frown. You mean that thing that has you putting those dreadful eyesores all over our lovely Equestria? She snorted. Oh, they'll look better when they're done. I promise. Apple Bloom says they'll be... elegant. You like elegant, right? Indeed I do, but I'll wait until I've seen them. Rainbow Dash's muzzle broke into a big grin. Just wait till you see the main hub. Actually, you can glimpse a construction of it if you stand high enough on the roof of the hospital. Just face towards the water tower and look about a hundred miles up and out. Rainbow Dash paused. 
you uh, might need binoculars. Or a telescope. Rarity retorted. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's not named yet. They wouldn't let me name it what I wanted to, even though it's my damn project and my ministry. So... You wanted to name it the Rainbow Dash's Mega Cool Center of Awesomeness, didn't you? Rarity asked, ribbing back. No, 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 no. Rainbow Dash hovered indignantly, then admitted. Uh, not exactly. Rarity laughed a charming and happy laugh. Go tend to your fan, Dash. I'll meet you later. Rainbow Dash grinned, waved, and swooped back to Tank Commander Torchwood. In seconds, they were deep into gushing over the aerial acrobatics of Rainbow Dash, a Pegasus who could apparently do a sonic rainboom in her sleep. Rarity turned and trotted away, humming a joyful tune. What did you do? Zenith was demanding of Calamity as I came out of the memory. The Pegasus cantered nervously. I don't know, it just started doing that. My ears perked up, picking up on a high whine coming from the antenna array. I looked to Calamity, who was staring at the terminal as if it betrayed him. With a sinking feeling, I asked, Did you trigger a lockdown? Calamity shook his head. Nah, I got in just fine, weren't that hard. He looked up at me, his eyes wide inside the bug-like nightmare helmet. And what is it then? What is this place? What is it you thought? Calamity swallowed. It's an enclave experiment, all right. Under orders of Harbinger, one of the Enclave High Council. They're playing with magic lace sonics, hoping to control the Hellhounds. They were trying to make these creatures into slaves, Xanath said in a low voice. I looked around, drinking in the sight of the rooftop with my new eyes. I'm guessing it didn't work. What do you think the chances are that we're really lucky and Calamity just triggered the Leave Us Alone signal? Velvet Remedy quipped grimly trotting to the roof's edge and looking down into the street. She immediately backed up, eyes wide and frightened, her face going pale under her charcoal coat. I dared a peek. Celestia's solar-heated libido. The street was full of hellhounds. Scores of them. More were moving out of doorways or climbing over buildings, all moving towards us. And they looked pissed. Footnote. Maximum level, 